It's 57 degrees. The Apostle Paul said, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather expose them. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11. Welcome to our study of Answering Denominational Doctrines. Our main objective in this series of lessons is to go to the Bible and see if the doctrines of men add up to and are compliant with the Word of God. It is the Bible that will be judged by. John 12, verse 48. It is the Word of God that has the power to save men's souls. Romans 1, 16. And when men put trust in traditions and their own ideas, just like in the days of Jesus, they're not acceptable to God. Matthew 15, verses 7 through 9. Today, we're going to be thinking about and studying about the doctrines of the Nazarene church or the Nazarene religion. As you think about this religious group, we first want to go back to the fundamentals, to the unique identifying characteristics of the church and compare those with the Nazarene religion and see if the two add up. And so we ask for, first and foremost, when did this denomination start? And history records it was start, started in October of 1895. Now, we then must ask, does that match with what you see in the New Testament. When did the Lord's church start? Well, Jesus promised it would begin. Mark chapter 9, verse 1, Jesus said, Assuredly, I say to you, to his disciples, there are some of you standing here today who will not taste death until you see the kingdom present with power. And so Jesus promised the kingdom was coming. He promised the church was coming. Matthew 16, verse 18, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And then he said to Peter, I'm going to give to you the keys of the kingdom. Church and the kingdom are one and the same. And so Jesus promised that in the lifetime of his disciples, the church, the kingdom was going to come. Did that happen? We open our New Testament to Acts chapter 2. Peter stands up with the eleven. He begins to preach the gospel of Jesus and salvation. They hear that message. They respond in baptism. And the Bible says in Acts 2 verse 47, the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. And so Jesus promised it. It happened in the New Testament. And thus, the Lord's church, the church you read about in this book, the Bible, started on Pentecost, A.D. In the, in, in the first century, on Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. And so that's thousand years earlier than we find, 1895 years earlier than we find what we see in the New Testament being taught. And so it doesn't match when the Lord's church began. Well, what about where? Where did the Nazarene religion begin? History again records that it started in Los Angeles, California. We again go to the New Testament and we find that the Lord's church started in Jerusalem. It was prophesied in Isaiah chapter 2 verses 2 through 4 that the word of the Lord would go forth from Jerusalem or Zion and that's where God's message of salvation would start. The house of God would be established there. Paul said in 1 Timothy 3.15 that the church is the household or family of God. Well, where did the church start? in Jerusalem on Pentecost in A.D. 30. And so again, we find that different than the Nazarene religion. The two don't go hand in hand in their unique characteristics. Well, how did and why did this movement start? History records that this movement started as a means of helping the poor and the needy. And there's nothing wrong. Christians ought to help the poor and the needy. James 1.27, Pure and undefiled religion before God the Father is to visit the orphans and the widows in their affliction and keep oneself unspotted from the world. Nothing wrong with helping the needy and the poor. That's a good work of Christians. 
But is that a reason to start a whole new religious movement? Shane, as we think about some of these other identifying characteristics, we, we're also going to learn who the founder of this movement is and, and what the kind of the foundation of it is. And do those match with what we see in the New Testament? No, it doesn't. In fact, what we find is a man by the name of Thanesis F. Bercy is the one who founded the Nazarene Church. Now, that doesn't fit the qualifications that we see in the church, for the church in the New Testament. For it is Jesus Christ who founded His church, which we know in Matthew 16, verse 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, Jesus said. So it doesn't match with regards to founders, is what we see with the church in the New Testament. Furthermore, we see, uh, the, you know, we might ask the question, well, who's the head of the Nazarene denomination? Well, while no one's considered to be a head of the, of the Nazarene church, this is what they say. They say, we are agreed on the necessity of a superintendency that shall complement and assist the local church in the fulfilling of its mission and, and objectives. The superintendency shall build morale, provide motivation, supply management and method assistance, and organize and encourage organization of new churches and missions everywhere. And Basically, it's visible in the form of a, a general assembly. But how do we compare that to the organization that we find for the New Testament church? Well, Jesus is head, Ephesians 1, and 23, of his church. And then we see that he has allowed that there be local congregations in which in each local congregation would be aut autonomous, that it would be self-governed, and that there must be elders, a plurality of elders, who have the qualifications of 1 Timothy 3, Titus chapter 1, and who would oversee each of those congregations. So as you can see, this doesn't really fit the organization of the church of the New Testament. And that's why we need to get back to just what the Bible says, go by God's wisdom and not man's wisdom. But Ben, what else do we see about the Nazarene denomination? Shane, that last part you mentioned, going back to the Bible, is another unique characteristic of the New Testament church. They built their belief system solely on the inspiration of Scripture and what it taught. Well, how does the Nazarene religion work in their authority? Remember, it's Jesus said, it's Jesus who said, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Matthew 28, verses 18 following. Does the Nazarene religion follow the authority of Jesus? What is their actual authority? It is the Bible and. And here's the problem. The Bible, no doubt, is our authority. But what about that and? And there's 16 articles of faith which they have originated and they publish out to their members and to the world to see. And, and many of those articles of faith we'll be discussing in just a moment. But do articles of faith have a place in our system of authority when it comes to Christ and Christianity and the church? Do I need to sit down and make up articles of faith for people to believe? Well, why would you do that? If you've got the Bible, why do you need any article of faith? Someone's rightly said, if it's more than the Bible, it's too much. If it's less than the Bible, it's too little. If it's the same as the Bible, why have it? There's no authority in the Scripture for men making their own articles of faith. We simply need to give book, chapter, and verse. Ask, what does the Scripture say? Romans 4, verse 3. Give a Bible answer, 1 Peter 3, verse 15. And do away with all these man-made doctrines and articles of faith. And, and Shane, even if that article of faith said the same thing as the Bible, why do you need to have that? Why not go just by what the Bible says. And so for a few moments, Shane, let's take a moment to examine uh, some of their doctrines and see, do they really fit with Scripture? Shane, I'll read what they say. And then you give a biblical answer for that doctrine. One of the major doctrines of the Nazarene movement is divine healing. Concerning this belief, the Nazarene Church Manual says... We believe in the Bible doctrine of divine healing and urge our people to seek to offer the prayer of faith for the healing of the sick. Providential means and agencies, when deemed, deemed necessary, should not be refused. And so, we all believe in providence, Shane. We believe God works through the power of prayer and in His providential means within His own law system, he does heal people. That's why we pray for Christians. But what about this idea 
of divine healing and asking God supernaturally to not manipulate His laws, but go around them. What does the text say? What does the Bible say about those ideas? When we think about the purpose of miracles, and we've talked about this before, but to understand the purpose of miracles, we got to realize that God gave them, to, uh, gave them in the first century for a good reason. And the reason is found in Mark 16. Uh, if you read very closely, uh, of course, Jesus had been talking about going into all the world and preaching the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that does not believe shall be damned. And so then he goes on to talk about this. It says in verse 17, And these signs will follow those who believe in my name. They will cast out demons. They will speak with new tongues. They will take up serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick, and they will recover. Okay, well... Why is it the case that this is occurring? What's the reason? Well, we find it in verse 19. So then after the Lord had spoken to them, he was received up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God, and they went out and preached everywhere, the Lord working with them and confirming the word through the accompanying signs. You see, as in Acts chapter 3, we get an example of this. There was a lame man laid at the beautiful gate. And what did Peter say to him? Rise up in the name of Jesus Christ. And, he gave, and that power came upon him, and he rose up quickly. And so we see that that was a great, uh, uh, a great starting point for Peter to preach the gospel to others in the audience because they were just amazed that this man, after I believe it was 40 years, had been laying there. And so now they were able to confirm the message with the accompanying sign, which was the healing of the lame man. And so that's why we see in like Hebrews chapter 2, verse 3 and 4, we see once again the purpose. It says this, God also bearing witness both with signs and wonders, with various miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to His own will. Bearing witness to what? Bearing witness to God, to His own word, that He is the one that gave this message. So, that's right. And so in the purpose of miracles, Shane, it... It wasn't, what you're saying is, the New Testament teaches, it wasn't just for self-gratification alone. Right. The miracles were to confirm the Word, and it was never just to help some person over here who was sick or something of that nature. And so in its purpose, it may be misguided as well, but also in its perpetuation. How were miracles perpetuated? We learn in Acts chapter 8, verse 18, a very powerful lesson about that. Simon has just obeyed the gospel. In his former life, he's been a magician, a trickster. Sleight of the hand, movement, taking something off and putting something on where you don't see it as well, those kind of things. And so Simon, through sleight of the hand, has been a magician. And Acts 8.18 says this, When Simon saw, through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give this to me also, that on whomever lay in my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. Now, Simon was rebuked. He repented of that, but there's a powerful point there. Simon recognized, and so many need to realize this today, the gift of the Holy Spirit, divine healing, speaking in tongues, those things was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands. My friend, what happened when the last apostle died? Well, that ability to pass that on perish with them also. It was never designed. Miracles were never designed to last beyond the writing of the New Testament, for it was, as Shane said, that, that confirmation, that sign. It's like when an ambulance drives by. Everybody looks. It gets their attention. If an explosion goes off, everybody looks that way. A big blinking sign. Everybody looks to see what's going on. Miracles were that not just an attention getter, but a, a powerful show of God's work. And it directed people to what was really important, the message of salvation. And so the perpetuation has also ended with the apostles. Now, Shane, what about when we come to the prolonging of that? Was it designed to be prolonged? Was it designed to be an ongoing thing that would happen forever? Miracles. What does 1 Corinthians 13 say about that? Paul says, love never fails, but where there are prophecies, they will fail. Where there are tongues, they will cease. Where there is knowledge, it will vanish away. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part. 
But when that which is perfect has come, then that which is in part will be done away. Well, what, what are we talking about, Paul? Well, that which is perfect has come. In which he was talking about the perfect law of liberty, James 1, verse 25, talking about the Bible, that the completed revelation of God's will for all mankind. And that's why there would be no reason to keep on bringing miracles because miracles were the, for the purpose, once again, of bringing you to the message. Yeah. And so, you know, when we think about uh, today, you know, Mormons still believe in miracles, and at least they're trying to be consistent, you mm -hmm. know, and they say, hey, we believe in the divine revelation as well, yeah. you know, but we recognize that miracles have ceased. You know, Shane, not only does it teach they weren't to be prolonged, but there's this idea of miracles being just the partial. You know, when I think about partial, I think, would you rather have the partial or would you rather have the full? Would you rather have a partial paycheck this week or rather get the whole thing? Would you rather have partial, the idea of partial miracles, prophesying, tongue speaking, all that was partial, but when the perfect comes, the partial be done away with. We're living in the age of the perfect law of liberty, James 1.25, and thus... We don't live in the age of miraculous divine healing like they did in the first century. Now, let me just give you some basic examples. If we live in the age of supernatural divine healing where men walking around today have that power and we don't go to St. Jude's Hospital and heal every sick child there, shame on us. How ridiculous and how hypocritical that is for Christians to claim. Yes, we can do this power, and then there be hospitals full of these people. If we've got the power and we can do that, why are there children sitting in St. Jude's Hospital right now dying of cancer? Nobody's going over there and healing them. Why are there cemeteries full of loved ones? Nobody's going over there and raising them. Why are there people walking around with deformed limbs and missing legs, missing arms? Nobody's putting those back on. Why is that? Because we don't live in that age anymore. It was designed to get men to the Word of God to determine who was God's spokesperson and to help people see this book is the message and where the power is today. Now, Shane, we don't want people to think we don't believe in the power of prayer. James 5, verses 13 through 15 teaches us clearly the prayer of faith saves. If I'm sick or if you're sick, I'm going to pray for you, you're going to pray for me, we're going to pray for sick people. And when we pray, we're asking God within His providential laws, in His laws, within His providence, to control that, to manipulate inside His own laws, not outside the boundaries, so that circumstances, events, the right medicine, the right doctor, will help us to be healed. We believe in prayer, but we don't believe that God, through divine healing, is working today. Mm -hmm. So let's go on. We're going to talk about a little bit on their uh, view of baptism. What do they say about baptism? Well, this is what you can find on the official website. It says, Baptism being a symbol of the new covenant, young children may be baptized upon request of parents or guardians who shall give assurance for them of necessary Christian training. Baptism may be administered by sprinkling, pouring, or immersion according to the choice of the applicant. Well, there's two things I see wrong there, Ben, that does not agree with the scriptures. The first thing is they say that young children may be baptized. Now, we need to ask ourselves, when, you know, there comes a time in every person's life when they start to recognize they're accountable to God's law. They recognize they've sinned against God's law. 1 John 3 verse 4 talks about that, he, that sin is a transgression of the law. So there's a time when I make the choice to sin against God that I turn against him, and so that is when I should be convicted by sin. Well, we know that little children, we know about how, you know, how innocent they are in the sight of God. In Matthew 18, what did Jesus say? Who, who is like the kingdom of heaven? You know, little children. Little children. Yeah. And so we think about that this probably comes, stems out of the old doctrines of, you know, of Augustine and John Calvin and goes back to original sin where sin from Adam and Eve was genetically passed on to all of us and we have this sinful nature is what they're, discuss what they're basically talking about. That's right. You know, the second thing you mentioned, Shane, is the form by which they might use. Well, there's a second problem in that statement. It is the method or form that they use. They would say, hey, whatever the applicant wants, pouring, sprinkling, immersion, 
either be fine. Well, is that what the Bible says? What does the Scripture say on this matter? Romans 4 verse 3. And in the Scripture, you will clearly find in every instance, baptism was full body immersion. Let me just give you a couple. Mark chapter 1 verses 9 through 11. At the baptism of Jesus, the Bible says, coming up out of the water, the Spirit descended upon him like a dove. But what do you have to do to come up out of water? You've got to go down into water. Romans 6, 1 through 4. Baptism is a burial. When you go to a graveside, you know they put the body all the way in the ground, covered on dirt at the bottom, every side, and they cover it on top. Complete immersion. John 3, verse 23. John was baptizing where there was much water. Why much? Pouring and sprinkling don't require much. Ah, but full body immersion does require much water. And so, in the New Testament, the word baptism means to submerge. There was a special and unique word, rantidzo, not baptizo, but rantidzo, which meant sprinkling or pouring. It's used in Hebrews 9 of the sprinkling of blood of bulls and goats. And so, God chose a word. When He had a word already that would mean sprinkling, God chose, and the Scriptures confirm, baptism is by immersion only. Now, Shane, as we think about the idea of justification and salvation, I want to read to you what the Nazarene manual says, and let's think about this idea of faith for just a moment. Concerning justification, salvation, in the Nazarene denomination, they say, we believe that justification, regeneration, and adoption are simultaneous in the experience of seekers after God and are obtained upon the condition of faith preceded by repentance. And so, in understanding what they say, Shane, they say, in essence, to be saved, it's on the condition of faith, but repentance must preceded. It has to be before. So basically, you've got to repent and believe, if I understand what they're saying correctly. And is that in accordance with what Peter said and with what the rest of the New Testament says? Well, they got part of it right. Faith is important. Repentance is important. But as we can see, there are other steps to getting into Jesus Christ to be saved from our sins. And we must recognize that we must confess the name of Christ, Romans 10, 9, 10, and be immersed in water for the remission of sins. You know, Ben, I can't help but think about probably the best way to help someone understand for the remission of sins is when you compare the phrase for remission of sins in Acts 2 verse 38 to Matthew 26 verse 28 in which Jesus said, This do in remembrance, for, remembrance of me, this is uh, because he shed his blood, he says, for the remission of sins. Now, did Jesus shed his blood because men were already saved? No. Or did Jesus shed his blood so that men might be forgiven, that they might obtain the remission of sins? That's right. And that's exactly what we see is logically that we, on our part, in obedience to God, would put our faith in Christ by completing the steps of obedience, which would require repentance, confession, and immersion in water. Yeah, exactly right. We're not denying, Shane, that faith is important. Jesus said, unless you believe that I'm healed, die in your sins, John 8, 24. We're not denying that repentance is important. Acts 3, verse 19, Peter preached, repent and turn again. But we don't stop there. Let's hear what the rest of the Scripture says. Must a man confess faith in Jesus Christ? Absolutely. Romans 10, verse 10 says, with the heart, with the mind, one believes unto righteousness and with the mouth. Confession is made unto salvation. And there's no denying. The scriptures teach baptism is essential. Just as Shane said, Matthew 26, 28, Jesus said, This my blood of the new covenant shed for many for the forgiveness or remission of sins. Acts 2, verse 38, Peter said, Repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Peter later said in 1 Peter 3, 21, Baptism does now also save us. Shane, there's one other principle I want us to discuss for just a minute about the Nazarene religion, and I think this will help people to see how sometimes men's religions drastically depart from the Bible. Here's what they say concerning women preachers and leaders. The Nazarene Church Manual says, We support the right of women to use their God-given spiritual gifts within the church. We affirm the historic right of women to be elected and appointed to places of leadership within the church of the Nazarene. Shane, that would imply that they could be elders, deacons, and that they could be preachers as well. 
What does the Scripture say? Is it clear on that, Shane? I believe it's very clear. You look in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 8. What does the Apostle Paul say? And let's say with, the, with love that women are not inferior. That's something that we need to recognize over and over again, that they are equal, but we have to recognize that God has given a different function to both men and women. And this is something for men to follow. It is something for ladies to follow as well. And which, here's what Paul says. I desire therefore that the men pray everywhere, lifting up holy hands without wrath and doubting, in like manner also that the women adorn themselves in modest apparel with propriety and moderation, not with braided hair or gold or pearls or costly clothing, but which is proper for women professing godliness with good works. Let a woman learn in silence with all, with all submission. And I do not permit a woman to teach or to have authority over a man, but to be in silence. Now, was this a cultural thing? Was this something that was just in the culture at Ephesus? Well, listen what Paul says next. He gives the reason. For Adam was formed first, then Eve. That is not going back to culture, but to creation. That's exactly right. Friend, today as we have studied the religion of the Nazarene movement, all we ask of you is to get your own copy of the Bible out and see if the things we've said are true. And if they are, believe it because God said it, not men. Remember, our objective in these lessons is simply to speak the truth in love. Ephesians 4.15 God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. 1 Timothy 2 verses 4 through 6 and that's our desire. More than anything, we want you to go to heaven. If you've never obeyed the gospel, maybe you've been caught up in religious error, maybe even this religious error. Friend, we invite you today to become just a Christian, just a member of the Lord's body. Would you hear the word? Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing, hearing by that word. Would you then believe Jesus is the Son of God and Savior of the world? John 8, 24. Would you believe it so much that you're willing to turn from sin and turn to God? Luke 13, verse 3. Would you make that great confession that the Ethiopian eunuch made? Acts 8, verse 36 through 38. And would you do what Jesus said in John 3, verse 5? Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. We urge you today to study these issues and as you find the truth, obey that truth so that you can be sure you're on the road to heaven. Select it. Screen recording.